So you're going back tonight? Yeah, right after. Yeah. So you're not, you're not, you're not. 
So he came to the United States for a while. And he just says, you know, no problem. But he always speaks with mother and sister. That's good. Yeah, yeah. And then there's a moment where he was like, I'm sorry. Yeah, it's that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so he goes to London. They're very excited to get there. He is with And he turns to oh, I guess we're going to go to the He looks around. He looks around. in my library somewhere. Yeah. And I read it. I, mean, I read this. I know I read it when I was in Chicago. Well, good afternoon. Uh, and it's my distinct pleasure and great honor 
uh, to introduce Cecile Fromont for her second of three lectures. Uh, my wonderful colleague, Suzanne, has recounted much of Cecile's impressive CV yesterday, so I won't repeat any of that. Uh, I'm just happy kind of to recount for you that I've known Cecile since she began her life as an art historian. In 2002, she left Paris to come to the United States and not only to leave behind the City of Lights, but social science for the humanities. She turned to art history, a field she had not studied really, <laughs> uh, but for one for which she had a passion. And she represented then, and she represents now, what it means to take a chance, to move beyond the expected, to learn anew. And Cecile did just that, finishing a dissertation in 2008 that then became an award-winning book that you all know six years later called The Art of Conversion, Christian Visual Culture in the Kingdom of the Congo. Cecile accomplished this and uh, much more, not because she was ambitious in the professional sense of the term, not, nor just because she had a passion for it. She, of course, had passion. She, of course, worked hard. No one finishes a dissertation in six years in the humanities if you don't work hard, very, very hard. I know. I took a while. Uh, now, she already knew several languages. She acquired more while she was at Harvard, as well as paleography. These are all technical skills without which one can't go very far or very fast. But these skills are not enough in and of themselves, and they were coupled with great intellectual imagination. What I mean here is not kind of some kind of flight of fancy, we all have those, but really the ability to imagine what needs to be questioned and why. This mode of creative questioning most often means forging a new field of inquiry, or at least greatly modifying a field through a keen sense that something important has been missing. And she did that. She took it to herself to make this a kind of inquiry that requires great dedication and seriousness, but something that is coupled with sheer joy in doing it. And I think we could all see that yesterday as Cecile presented to you what she's working on, a real joy in presenting, discussing, leading you through her own thought process. It is, in fact, the satisfaction of making the past as embodied by a set of images and objects to come alive to those who have either ignored it or forgotten about it, perhaps unintentionally, but more likely intentionally. It's a different kind of inquisition than the one she discusses. It is about the freeing of ideas and people, not the shackling of them. Cecile is a model for why we need to take chances in the world that is increasingly risk averse. Cecile took a chance to do something new out of a real desire to learn and to do. And the graduate program, which notoriously is risk averse, took a chance and said, yes, please come. This might work out. And it did. So just as we heard yesterday, and as we will hear today, we will listen to the work of a scholar who is not just intellectually, uh, who is not intellectually distanced from her subject. Rather, we hear a person who, of course, is an accomplished academic, but she is also a street fighter in the arena of ideas. Someone who grabs us by the lapels and says in the sweetest, most beguiling way, listen up, this is really important. And it cannot be left in the rubbish heap at the feet of the angel of history. And I'll tell you why. This is important to me, and it's important to you to know. And so, as we embark on the second lecture, let's listen up.
Thank you, Sam. Thank you very much. I am very, very happy and honored to be here. And um, for those of you who were here yesterday, welcome back. Thank you for coming back. And for those of you who weren't, welcome. I'm excited to have you here. Uh, yesterday, uh, I invited the ancestors to join us. And um, I want to do this today, too. If, um, and I bring just some rum and a light for them. Uh, hopefully, they weren't too bored and they will uh, come back. Uh, but at least there is light and rum for them So in it. So probably they'll be here. Um, I also would like to thank my academic kin, my academic family, um, who are kindly here today, were there yesterday too, teachers, mentors, colleagues, students. Um, and I really owe to you guys everything, and I'm so grateful uh, for having the opportunity to talk in front of you. And so this is for you guys. And let's uh, start. The archives of the Portuguese Inquisition have preserved the story of José Francisco, an enslaved man captured and tried in Lisbon between 1730 and 1731 for making and selling amulets, known in the 18th century Portuguese-speaking world as the Bolsas de Mandinga. The manuscript report of the proceedings recorded the details of his biography, the circumstances of his denunciation, the minutiae of his activities, and the evolution of his confessions. The listless, perfunctory scribing of the dialogues and declarations from the inquiry and trial formed a neatly stitched bundle, a masu, the exact word still in use today in the Portuguese archival nomenclature to refer to the document. That's a photo of the masu to the left. The traces of speech seized therein in ink on paper were meant to exist quietly and really not expected to ever speak again. The archived bundle and other related paper packets also kept silent within their pages the amulets that Jose Francisco and his colleagues crafted out of paper, ink, cloth, Catholic sacra, and biological samples. But of course, you guessed, the archival remains were only waiting to speak again. Since the 1980s, they have held court among scholars with whom they have shared their numerous, intricate, dramatic, heart-wrenching, at times hilarious stories in a microcosm of human nature, mostly at its worst. The recorded words have been a bounty for social historians who have traced through them the lives of many actors of the Portuguese world in captivating and crucially important books and essays. With its bundles, within archival bundles, amulets, within administrative amulets, the Inquisition archive has much more still to tell. Bringing together the physical with the biographical, words with matter, designs with formulae, its record also traces how African and European esoteric motif, ingredients, and conceptions of the supernatural flowed together into the creation of African masterminded empowered objects objects that animated the 18th century Atlantic world. This afternoon, we will look together at the intersection of archive, objects, and life stories to grasp the elusive nature and modus operandi of the Afro-Atlantic empowered bundle we met and discussed yesterday. Turning scraps into empowered material, assuring users from vulnerability to fortitude, projecting trace into space, the packets were constructions that transformed the narrow world of life in enslavement or disenfranchisement into a universe of broad transoceanic horizons. The transmutation at play was one of physical, psychological, and semiotic alchemy that gave the bundles material form, spiritual substance, and social power. So let's lend an ear to the archive and hear from José Francisco. 
the Inquisition recorded him as natural or born in Ouida after the port on the West African Bight of Benin, where he was caught into the Atlantic slave trade at the age of 13 or 14. And so we are looking at um, this region here in the curve of the continent, right? The coastline would be something like this. The exact policy within which he grew up is unclear, but his connection to one of the closely related base speaking groups of the region, the Aja, the Fon, the Ewe, is almost certain. The story of his spiritual coming of age in West Africa appears in the Inquisition file we've been looking at. In a truly remarkable early description of West African religious experience, although one formatted to follow the language of the Inquisition, Jose Francisco explained his devotion to the leopard. He answered that, the file reports, recording the voice of the accused in the third person, and I quote, being still in the land of Ouida, the devil started to appear to him in the, for in the form of a leopard and told him, that he should favor him in all things, and that he had to give him offerings, remedius, so that not to be wounded by knife or iron, asking for his soul and to be adored as God. And thus he promised the devil before being baptized Christian." End of quote. This type of revelation, initiating a personal relationship between deity as devotee, is archetypical of Vodun, the religion of Fon and related people in and around Wida. Anybody familiar with Vodun practices as described in 20th century ethnographies will recognize in Jose Francisco's description the characteristic experience of a practitioner of that religion. But beyond this long durée comparison with uh, practices that we know from centuries later and the methodological issues that it poses, 17th and 18th century documents from European travelers um, and uh, missionaries sketch also a historically specific background for this testimony. What emerges from this description is the portrait of a religion organized around a personal cult to one of a range of deities. In rituals, devotees bring offerings to please the gods and ensure their benevolence toward them. Gods, in turn, make their will and desires clear to their servants. One of the sources, dated around 1714, described fa divination at length, including a description of the board one foot long and one and a half large, the cup made of wood of copper in which the diviner puts its palm nuts, and of the diviner's designs traced in wood dust. This is a 17th century uh, board uh, collected um, uh, uh, on the Benin coast and entered the Ulmer, well, entered European connections circa 1650 and is now in the Ulmer Museum uh, in Germany. Um, and it offers a glimpse of the designs and the motif that were circulating in the region um, during uh, the time of José Francisco's childhood. What is notable in particular uh, are the empowered packets that we see on the forehead of the bearded divinity presiding over divination here, Legba. It has one, two, three bundles uh, on his forehead. Um, also the dense accumulation of motif around the perimeters um, that show animals, designs, and um, uh, different types of objects uh, depicted. And this board uh, and the descriptions that we have, and I'm not bringing in uh, the laundry list uh, of those uh, details, uh, but together they give us a sense of the visual and religious context of Jose Francisco's upbringing. And we will not in particular the role of tracing and designs as gateways for invisible forces to make their presence sensible. Jose Francisco's confessions took place after almost a year of inquisitorial proceedings, broken by torture and imprisonment, but also wizened by months of reckoning with his fellow inmates about the best strategy to bring the ordeal that was his examination to an end. Jose Francisco's confessions became increasingly lengthy and in keeping with the expectations of the inquisitors in their language and content. 
in the dialogic transcription of what Carlo Ginsberg rightly called a slippery process, Jose Francisco's dealing with the devil took center stage. The inquisitor's salacious questions elicited often scabrous answers in which the demonological language of Portugal loomed large. Yet in the midst of his landry list of European satanic cliches, the accused also brought up his early encounter with the supernatural in Africa. At that point, the course of the confession changes from hastened declarations to specific remembrance and vivid descriptions when Wida and the leopard are mentioned. Leopards, of course, are relatively rare um, in the European imaginary of the demonic, but on the contrary, in the realm of base speaking people and religious practices, they are absolutely central. So in contrast to many other documented instances of diasporic manifestations of African religiosity in the 18th century or earlier, Jose Francisco's experiences, activities, and products as the bolsa maker can be firmly placed within a specific cultural, religious, and historical context and framed within individual experience. We can follow him, a young man formed by his upbringing on the Ouida coast, as he grappled with life in enslavement first in Brazil and later in Portugal. Even more strikingly, we can follow the development of his relationship with the supernatural from one shore of the Atlantic to the next. Although men and women from varied parts of Africa crafted and intervened in the construction and use of the bolsas, including the ones Jose Francisco used and sold, they resonated through him with the specific ideas, practices, and religious sensibilities of a man born and raised in Ouida, circa 1700, enslaved in Brazil and captured in Lisbon by the Inquisition. His singular itinerary brings a historically grounded perspectives on the bolsas and on the material and spiritual journeys that gave the Afro-Atlantic its contours. Um, so I put arrows from Ouida, Brazil, and Portugal there. Working within, if often against, Portuguese society, Mandingueiro, that is to say, bolsa makers, as José Francisco, selectively drew from the material, visual, and religious environment of the world around them. This sought the numinous power of whole or parts of Catholic consecrated objects, such as holy hosts, purificator cloths, or pieces of altar stones. They also counted on the potential of ingredients of ambiguous nature, origins, or that challenge human senses and pointed to the limits of the, uh, their abilities, of the ability of the senses to comprehend the natural world and its course. Their bags could contain lead, a material that is heavier than it looks, or sulfur, a mineral that really feels organic more than inert. Um, they also would include thunderstones, um, these Neolithic tools that appears as if fully formed in the aftermath of the storm. Um, and that would be true in Brazil, uh, in uh, Africa, and in Europe alike. They also included already functioning talismans, such as uh, pierced coins at the bottom there that were used as amulets all over the Portuguese world. In some cases, we could see a clear relationship of cause-consequence or some metaphorical associations that underlay the choice of material. Lead balls um, here, we would presume, would take the lead in protecting against firearms, while purificators, um, these are the cloth that you use to wipe the chalice after the wine has been turned into uh, the blood of Christ. Um, so these purificators in Portuguese sanguineos would probably be apt at soaking up blood, sangue. These items that were painstakingly described in the Inquisition transcript largely echo the more limited record of ingredients in Afro-Atlantic pouches elsewhere in the Circum-Atlantic. The Spanish Inquisition, for instance, tell us about the bag that protected Antonio de Salinas in Cartagena against a cannonball. And this is the um, 
ugly image of the record uh, for Antonio. Um, and its bag, it tells us uh, around here, contained prints of saints, sticks, leaves, holy bread, manuscripts and printed Catholic prayers, all wrapped in textiles. In French records from the western part of the Caribbean island of Hispaniola, which they called Saint-Domingue, right here, The emphasis on Catholic sacra as key ingredients of the bundles the enslaved created also struck European observers. Almost all the neg, write French civil administrator Courtin about the enslaved inhabitants of the island, have some god corps, such as some piece of cotton that a witch sells to them very expensively, or other trifles. The ideas of his bundles, the macandal, Cotin continues, is made with bones taken from cemeteries and above all those of baptized children, holy bread, blessed incense, blessed wax, holy water and some metal nails that they put in a packet tied with strings from both ends and where there is a quantity of knots." End of quote. In this packet, another French observer summed up the enslaved and I quote him, driven by coarse superstition, often mix the holy things of our religion with profane objects of an idolatrous cult. In fact, the inquest into the activities of François Macandal, the great 18th century spiritual and political leader after whom the empowered packet took their name, revealed that Macondal makers kept an inventory of crucifixes to be used in their bundles upon request or need for their clients. A crucifix, it emerged from the inquest, could even suffice to form a Macondal when tied together with other materials, for example, a few vegetal leaves. More frequently, however, the Catholic object featured within the bundle alongside other ingredients. Recipes varied, but the bundles Francois himself created included crucifixes as a central ingredient. If no example of the 18th century bundles remain or have been identified to my knowledge, our informant, Courtin, sat directly in front of one as he wrote the lengthy memorandum that I have been quoting. To his horror, he exclaimed, contrived in a flippant ecrisis, the packet had at its heart a lead crucifix buried within layers of knots, ties, and coating, so that only its head and the tip of its arms remained visible. It is easy to see a connection between the Macandal Courtin describes and Pake Congo, one of the emblematic ritual objects of Haitian voodoo today. As the name suggests, the association between this type of bundles of a crucifix with empowered material and Congo as a real or imagined realm has become an enduring feature on the Caribbean island. Examples of ritual constructions from Central Africa, such as this in Kisi, an association of roots and wooden crucifix collected in the Congo in the 1900s, is also a striking transatlantic parallel. But 18th century Macandal are not Pake Congo, and neither are they Central African in Kisi. Conflating these three categories of objects only sketches a flattened and ultimately erroneous picture of Afro-Atlantic spiritual history in which neither time nor space are given proper consideration. Instead, the biographical background of Francois Macandal opens a window on the specific perspectives and techniques that he brought to bear as a man almost certainly from Central Africa on his attempts at channeling invisible forces in Saint-Domingue through the crafting of empowered bundles. By considering his point of view, as I consider that of José Francisco, and I wanted to show you this um, image. This is the signature of José Francisco that crossed there on the Inquisition trial. In considering these two men's point of view uh, in discussing the Bolsa and the Macondal, 
I do not attempt to de decipher a hidden African meaning of the bundles or to establish the identity as object hailing from this or that part of Africa. Rather, the point of view of François Macandal brings a historically grounded perspective on the techniques that went into the packet's construction, on the ways in which they were used, and on the nature and form of the powers they exerted over their material and spiritual environment. So to be clear, I do not suggest that Macandal's um, Central African perspective was the only or even the principal element that informed even his own packets, as I do not suggest that José Francisco's bolsas were wholly or simply Vodun objects. Rather, bringing their perspective to bear on an analysis of the empowered objects places them in a specific historical and geographic context that of the deep and multivalent connections that the 18th century Atlantic traffic in enslaved men and women created between European and African material and spiritual realms. My goal here is to gain a historical understanding of the material, visual, and spiritual transmutations through which African ritual specialists transformed chosen ingredients of the European and material worlds in which they lived into objects of Afro-Atlantic agency. Echoes of Central Africa did loom large in the crucifix cum macandal that so struck Courtin in Saint-Domingue. And here I show you a Congo crucifix from the probably 17th, 18th century. The background of the Christian kingdom of Congo whose elite has staked their claim as part of Christendom since the early 16th century, provides an obvious backdrop to François Macandal's recourse to crucifixes. He had been, in Courtin's own word, a captain in his country and a man whose genteel gestures and noble demeanor marked him in the eyes of the French as elite among his peers. We don't know exactly what part of Central Africa was once François Macandal's home, but many are the parallels between Macandalism and religious and social habits in and around the 18th century Christian Congo. Macandal and his followers, for instance, used crucifixes, as did the Christian elite of the African kingdom, not only as ritual objects, but also as insignia and means of spiritual protection. In the Congo, crucifixes heralded their wearers belonging to Christendom. In Saint-Domingue, Courtin reported, packets with the Catholic objects belonged to and designated the most faithful followers of Macandal. A crucifix worn on the battlefield in Central Africa would protect a soldier against the physical perils of battle. Across the waters, it would shield its owners from slavery's many forms of physical abuse. These direct and, after all, narrow connections, however strong as they may be, are ingredients, but not recipes, of Macandal. The Afro-Atlantic bundles gain material form, spiritual substance, and social power through mechanisms that operated at a higher plane. Ontological inquiries into the material and spiritual transmutations at play in the bundles need a broader view. The stories of François Macandal, José Francisco, and their colleagues, archived in slippery but rich archival documents, afford us just such a perspective and one, what is more, that is anchored in time and space. With the men's African-owned worldviews as the background and the objects they created as foreground, one of the mighty instruments at work in the bundles gains clear contour that is the manipulation of multiple dimensions. One initiate in Macandal from Saint-Domingue and a close follower of François, the very appropriately named Mercure, gave a crucial exegesis of the crucifixes used in his group's empowered packets. The crucifix, he declared in his interview with Courtin, and I quote him directly, the crucifix does not stand for God who is in heaven, but for the sign of the cross. 
in what may seem an enigmatic formulation, Mercure referred to a critical aspect of Central African thought in which the cross understood as intersection defined empowered spaces and marked specific points in space as a nexus between the visible and invisible worlds. Crossroads, for instance, formed one such site and were privileged ritual loci for initi initiation, rites of passage, or the activation of power objects. Accordingly, crucifixes had been powerfully ambivalent items in the Congo, where they operated simultaneously as an icon of the narrative of Christ's demise and an abstract symbol of the locally grounded ideas about the permeability of the realm of the living and the realm of the dead. Mercure, it appears, perceived this ambivalence in Macondal crosses, and in a testimony given after he had been condemned to burn at the stake, took pain to articulate that for him and his fellow initiates, only the latter was true. This reading of crucifixes is not surprising. In and around the Congo itself, emblems and rituals of Catholicism not only function alongside cults standing outside or even against the Roman church, they sometimes inspired them. An anthropomorphic figure here um, with a large crucifix around the neck in a photograph in the 20th century gives us an illustration of the types of practices mixing Christian and non-Christian objects that we know very well from descriptions of the 17th and 18th century. And this is blank. <clears throat> Mercure's declaration is significant because it demonstrates the elaborate ways in which the Macondal functioned. At one level, tin or lead crucifixes cheaply acquired from missionaries or merchants across Saint-Domingue lent power to the bundles as ingredients the enslaved harvested from their Caribbean environment. But they also, and according to Mercure, principally operated at another level as two-dimensional markers. They were not portraits of God who is in heaven, not Catholic sacra used against its dogma, but signs, crosses, intersecting lines, markers of a point of contact between the sensible and insensible worlds. In other words, they formed portable coordinates relocating their owners within a universe in which life, death, and the numinous belong to horizons that no longer conform to those of life in plantation slavery. Ingredients in the bowls has also shifted between the two and the three-dimensional. Composations varied, but ink on paper was an essential and in some cases sufficient component of the amulets. In 1743, the Inquisition asked Antonio Mascareñas an enslaved man from Angola who learned the art of the bolsas in Rio to describe the first mandinga he ever saw. And these are examples of mandinga papers that are not directly linked to uh, Mascarinhas. So Mascarinhas is asked, what is a mandinga? It was, he answered, a paper, carta, that he said was of mandinga with various designs, figuras, painted in red ink, among which were an image of Christ our Lord crucified and a mask, kahonka, in the form of a person's face and many other things like trivets and grates and other designs. Striking us first in his description of the bolsas from the perspective of a novice African is the highlight of the role of paper. What is that object he received? It is a paper and a paper holding various designs. Mentions of geometric elaborations, a crucifixion scene, and the enigmatic reference to a grotesque face talk to the repertoire of visual references available to the recently enslaved men. Select Christian iconography was part of his imaginary in the form of the crucifix, while what was probably a skull of bone or a Veronica veil made sense to him as a face or a kahanka a word that referred to grotesques such as those in architectural features or ships' figureheads. And of course, both ships and fountains were such important places of slave um, socialization. 
So Antonio's evocative comparisons of the designs to trivets or grids explicitly spell a link between the two-dimensional geometric patterns and ironwork. The reference further fleshes out the workings of Antonio's imaginary in which iron and ironwork must have dwelled pr prominently. The material held multivalent connotations of power, prestige, and fortitude around the Atlantic, be it in Antonio's native West Central Africa, the Bight of Benin, or Europe. The specialized skills of Smith, the spectacular transformation of the material in color, shape, uh, and hardness from red hot, malleable, to um, dark, cold, and hard material, all inspired awe, evoked risk, and suggested luminous intervention in all three cultural areas. And of course, it was against iron itself, we recall from yesterday, that many bolsas uh, protected, serving as shields against knives, swords, firearms, or the real and metaphorical shackles of enslavement. The visual comparisons held for further significance as ink itself counted iron as one of its ingredients, which mixed with sulfur, another component of the bolsas, transformed into iron sulfate. So the light uh, compound in turn mixed as a liquid with an equally light oak gold uh, solution. So this is uh, iron sulfate uh, solution, uh, oak gold solution, and when mixed together, they're both light become black. And here you can't see anything because it's all black, dark ink. And that dark ink um, would, once on the page of the, uh, of the paper, oxidize further on the surface and become an even darker mark. Mandingueros needn't have been chemists to be aware of ink's special status. The remarkable transmutation at work in the tracing medium relied on ingredients that, as premixed ink itself, would be procured in pharmacies, centers of knowledge about the arts of healing and material transformation, home to holders of secrets about matters potential to ail or to hurt. <coughs> we know that while in Brazil, José Francisco enlisted the penmanship of the son of a pharmacist, leaving little doubt that ink's material and chemical properties would be known to and valued by the mandingueiro. The choice of substance for inscription for the bolsas was all but innocuous. We know that blood, for instance, was at time a necessary pigment for particular pouches. And here on this page, the dark lines would be ink, and then the brownish lines would be blood, um, it explains from the left arm of the person for whom um, the bolsa would be made or chicken, depending on what was available. So the reference to iron work also tells us much about the types of designs in Manjinga papers beyond the few examples left in the Inquisition records. 17th and 18th century Portuguese decorative window grates or forged furnishings such as beds of chimney racks reinforce the stylistic contours of Manjinga designs of linear geometric elaborations. They also underscore the connection that Antonio made between ironwork and ink designs. Others among enslaved and free Africans of the Atlantic diaspora drew similar links between objects in the rounds and drawing on the ground. Today, Haitian voodoo practitioners, for instance, make a similar corollary in the composition of their West and Central African inspired VV. They are ground drawings using cornmeal, charcoal, or other powders. Linear tracing of worldly objects or abstract forms that are two dimensional invocations of deities. Stylus serves or iron grates, for example, make up the designs that summon the powerful presence of belligerent god Ogun. So here is a VV from Haiti, an example from um, uh, Benin or Togo, both contemporary, and then uh, designs from Cuba, actually, um, that are echoing uh, the same use of the trace and its projection uh, into space. 
There are no documents, to my knowledge, of Vevey in 18th century, but Frenchman Moreau de Saint-Méry recorded in 1797 a very similar ritual tracing on the ground of a circle with a black substance. And Mercure, we recall, also gave us a testimony of his fluid connection that he made between object and trace. Um, this is um, the VV for Ogun. And what I would like to underline is not only the types of design, but the certain quality of the line, right? And the ways in which um, it is uh, used to create those intricate uh, designs. The Inquisition file does not record Antonio explicitly mentioning writing in his description, but he clearly noticed it on the page as he sought the help of a student in Madeira to reproduce the bolsa he first acquired. Much has been written about the curiosity among Africans from regions without writing traditions at the ability of words on paper to speak. But suffice it to say today that the enslaved had numerous opportunities to experience the power of words on paper in the journey through the worlds Europeans dominated. Words on paper, they were told in church, made the numinous audible. Directly, violently, and powerfully, words on paper changed lives when ink on a baptismal record altered one's name or on a sales contract changed one's owner and the entire horizons of one's lived circumstances. That written and spoken words held complementary powers in the view of Manjinga users appears in their activation rituals. For the Manjinga to be really powerful, Antonio added, echoing many of his colleagues, you have to put it between the altar stone and the altar's cloth so that mass would be said over it. Thus, the nature of ink on paper as a mode of inscription, a way to capture the otherwise elusive or transitory, devout invocations, ideas, change itself, did not escape the Manjingueros. They literally harness that potential of ink on paper for their own purposes. Beyond still the power of words and inscription, the ink on paper designs of the bolsas themselves demonstrate elaborate reckonings about the power of two-dimensional form. Antonio's testimonies already hinted to the connections he made between iron implements and ink on paper designs that we mentioned. If we also look at one of Jose Francisco's bolsas, um, we see at the bottom the Caravaca cross, recognizable by its characteristic double horizontal bars, features, um, and it features prominently uh, at the bottom of the page. The Caravaca cross is a type of cross used in Iberia as an amulet, which powers derived from their miraculous prototype, a reliquary of the true cross held in the namesake Spanish town. As the bolsa, Caravaca crosses were empowered containers, and the trope carried over to the pieces of altar stones that were key ingredients in the packet. A liturgical object defined itself by the relics it held um, in, a, in a hole, and the relic in the, is what made the altar stone uh, efficient. The circle um, with uh, a cross here um, was likely a host, often uh, uh, an ingredient cited in the composition. And that further points to the connections between bolsas and relics. All the drawn ingredients in the bolsas um, included medals or coins. Um, uh, the coat of arm here, I think, was derived from seeing it on a coinage. And that the Manjingero understood paper itself as three-dimensional appears in the creasing of the once folded sheets or in the bleeding from one side to the next. And um, what is a um, telltale sign here is the intersection of the lines from the reverse of the paper that meets exactly uh, on that side uh, of the cross there. Uh, and here you can still see the creases um, and the ways in which the paper rubbed against the skin once it did become a packet by being folded uh, in itself. 
The boss's play on dimensionality further appears in the use of feathers in the designs. Feathers were essential offering in fa divination, in vodun and other African ritual traditions, and certainly were one of the drawn ingredients. The feathers around the host here, uh, or the pointed arrow with two feathers above them, there in another bolsa, um, take the shape of a ritual instrument. They recall, for instance, the headpiece of a Vodun deity pictured here in the 17th century uh, manuscript. But the feathers also point to um, the moment on the paper, the site on the paper where dimensions explicitly collapse. At the time of its making, the flat drawing encompassed a third dimension in the form of the quill and a fourth in the gesture of tracing. The repetitive, attentive movement necessary to the production of the intricate designs demonstrate that the Manjinga papers were as much about their making as they were about their contents. Tracing, we recall, was itself a prominent religious technique in Vodun, used in fa divination and other rituals to invoke the presence of the deities through gestures and patterns of protection. A ritual practitioner portrayed here in the early 19th century in Brazil demonstrates for us such a powerful apotropaic gesture and the multidimensional protection it brought its users. The poised and elegant man, the French artist labeled Black Magician, stands firmly on the ground and uses a large stick in its right hand to encompass himself in a clockwise circle that is a trace on the ground, a gesture being performed, and a column of protection. This folding and unfolding of objects into lines and of trace into space this projection from drawing to protecting is at the core of José Francisco's bolsas. This expansive, and in this case, Vodun-derived understanding of visual form as efficacious invocation of numinous presence, also encompasses the other designs, the cross, the Ama Christi, the esoteric writing, and prayers. This is the mode of thinking that art historian Dana Rush attributes to what she calls Vodun's unfinished aesthetic. Vodun's unfinished aesthetics is what allows initiates to treat something newly seen as something already known because images and gods, visual stimulus and divine presence work in close concert. There is, in her words, a process of infinite aesthetic and spiritual synesthesia. She means by that a process in which visual impact in an infinite range of possible forms can produce godly presence. Initiates like José Francisco are the ones who may recognize and channel that visual impact. They are the ones who have the power to make powerful images, but also to make images powerful. This idea of Vodun's unfinished aesthetics is the key to grasp, if not to understand, the drawings in the bolsa. Instead of attempting to decipher them as coded, maybe disguised African designs, we can rather interrogate what those, after all, mostly European motifs, evoked to José Francisco, and how they brought him the real security he felt upon invoking them. As he used elements from the Portuguese visual, material, and spiritual environment to market that sense of security to his clients, José Francisco stretched the perimeter of both Vodun's and Christianity's numinous realm. Vodun found itself enticed by Christian designs while Catholic symbols became seats for the powers of Vodun. So even in their minimal forms as single pieces of paper or a single crucifix, bolsas and macondal remain decidedly material objects. The varied ingredients that the specialists combined not only join their causal or metaphorical force into an empowered single packet, they also change in nature and became manjinga or macondal, that is to say efficacious in a specific sense. 
the transmutation at work here is ontologic, ontological in that the ingredients change in kind from scraps of Portuguese or French religious, visual and material environment to singular objects of fierce and trustworthy might. This Afro-Atlantic alchemy is a material transmutation, ingredients combined into a new metamorphose whole. Psychological transformation, assuring makers and users from powerlessness to security. And as we saw yesterday, a quiet but profound form of political revolution, recasting power and the means of its exercise. Ultimately, the bundle summoned into being an Afro-Catholic domain of material form, spiritual substance and social power. And this is the domain that we will explore tomorrow. Thank you. So I wasn't, I wasn't yesterday, uh, unfortunately. Uh, I hope I'm not saying something that might have come uh, before. For someone like me that works on the Iberian world and has worked uh, much with inquisitorial material, mm -hmm. much, many of these things resonate. Uh, and uh, I was wondering if in any of these trials that they've been um, working with, uh, the objects themselves have been seized and kept with the trials. Mm -hmm. I'm saying this because, uh, for example, the use of uh, crucifixes in uh, what they, uh, the inquisitors, define as magical practices, uh, it is documented, for example, well documented in the tribunal of Cuenca, and it is documented with moriscos. Moriscos meaning both uh, converted Arabs uh, from Islam, but also sub-Saharan uh, uh, moriscos that stayed in Spain uh, after 1609. In the 17th century, uh, Wax crucifixes are, are, are seized by the Inquisition and discussed as being used in, 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 in magical practices, which um, speaks certainly about how not the sacramental, but the, what the Catholic Church defines as the sacramentary uh, um, aspect of uh, the rituals could be a place precisely of what you're saying, negotiation, right? So uh, actually, after reading the trial, and this crucifix, in, uh, wax crucifix, something like 20 centimet centimeters high, uh, does exist. Uh, so, uh, and is described as being used in these practices. The other thing, so, uh, so, so I was wondering uh, how the Iberian frontier, not only uh, south to the, uh, uh, to, to, to the Mediterranean, but also including in Spain already, right? And way before that, because uh, Morisco uh, magic is a practice that is described in inquisitorial uh, sources from very early. Uh, mm, how would this work out? The other, the, the other place where, I've, where, where we were saying resonated in, uh, in things that I've been working with, uh, I never thought about this about until right now, is the uh, immense collection of graffiti in the um, prison of the Inquisition in Palermo. These mm. graffiti have not unfortunately been published, but they're now open. I've been yeah. twice there. And when, uh, the, the, um, when I was there uh, in the last time, I was told, I mean, for example, crucifixes with the Arma Christi, uh, with inscriptions, obviously, uh, as talismans, for a population of, of imprisoned people that could come from all over around the Mediterranean. And they tell you, because that is when they're restored, some of them are actually made with uh, blood. Uh, and they say, well, you know, because we didn't have painting until, you, I, uh, until today, then I said, no, it is not because we didn't have painting. I mean, it's obviously because of the, as you were saying, the, the talismanic uh, potential, right? So, uh, I mean, you know, it's just, just two comments on how these things make, uh, really expand when you put them into the into the Iberian uh, uh, geography, right? Including other uh, um, other uh, kinds of uh, of population. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Absolutely. Um, so I, I have 
three pieces of answer. Um, one of them is, yes, some of the objects are um, seized, and this is one of them, for example, that is stitched within um, um, the bundle. The other thought is um, that, yes, there is absolutely something um, very usual, very banal about the types of designs and objects um, um, that are being put together. And what is surprising is that um, even though these are very Christian or very European esoteric material, users and makers and sensors understand that these are African objects and they really attach their efficacy to the fact that they are made by Africans and the most recently arrived African, the better. So there is something happening there. And so that leads me to the third point, which is, well, then what do you do when you have objects that um, you know are African objects, but they don't look the part, right? How do you uh, find a way to read them specifically? So in my case, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in looking at that particular moment of the history of the Atlantic world. How do you read them in a way that brings into play um, the different backgrounds from the African continent while still very carefully measuring the distance between that background and then the new kinds of objects that are being produced. Um, and that's the challenge. And I think that's a challenge that's very similar and parallel to many studies with inquisitory material that there is something banal about them. Um, and certainly the distance between the objects and the reaction to the objects is always a little bit baffling, right? And in that space is where the historian has a you know, playing field. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much uh, <clears throat> for uh, another wonderful talk. Uh, as a historian, I've uh, long been concerned about how to historicize belief in Africa. <laughs> Uh, and I sort of see attempts to use, let's say, 19th century sources to describe a 17th century or an 18th century practice, and I scratch my head and say, okay, it doesn't work like that. And I look at things like word and things and how linguists try to combine words with ethnographic material and app scream to try to give it social life. So I got a little excited when I began to read about records from the Inquisition. And the very detailed investigations and interrogations of uh, first generation Africans and their religious practices. And I wondered whether maybe this could be a lens on let's say what is happening in the 17th century and the 18th century. But as you talk about an Afro-Atlantic alchemy, clearly what we are hearing may not be easily discernible in terms of what I might consider the African input. So now I have question marks against my initial enthusiasm, <laughs> but I'm also asking you to kind of reflect on this mm -hmm. dilemma. And in this contest of alchemy, what remains that is African? That might be useful for someone like me looking at this from an African perspective. Yes, thank you. I, one of the ways uh, um, that I started looking at these documents, and it was exactly the same, uh, the same sense of excitement, in particular with Jose Francisco, when he's describing basically his initiation. Um, and it's a difficult text because it is uh, mediated through the language of the Inquisition, but there is still kind of this moment in, when you're doing a textual analysis where the rhythm slows and he starts talking so specifically about his encounter with the leopard and how that did to him. So there is something there that is very much a first-person account of you know, becoming a devotee on the Bight of Benin around 1700, so that's very striking. However, what it's also telling us is how this moment was already imbricated within larger flows and larger phenomena that had to do with the Atlantic world, so that 
in a kind of intuitive quest for the you know ground zero against which we could um, see historical developments, well, of course, it's already uh, part of history in motion. Um, and from that realization, then we have to recast our questions and think about um, what is the nature of the moment, of the historical moments that we are looking at. And once we have um, characterized that moment, um, to think about the ways in which change and continuity, but also um, uh, uh, really radical ruptures would come into play. And in the case of José Francisco, the radical rupture is through his enslavement. The nature of his relationship changes to all of his pieces that already bore to his coming of age as a Vodun initiate. In Wida at that time, or around Wida, where there is large movement of military and conquest, and the, his world was already um, the world of the Atlantic. but his relationship to this larger um, uh, horizon, so to speak, changed personally. So you have to play, or at least my solution is to play with these categories and um, the ways in which to order them. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. I, I have one question, uh, and really a comment as well, is that, and this leads from your question, is that there are, as different communities are coming together, through uh, the economy of slavery uh, with different traditions, there are these meta-texts that they all have to ascribe to, uh, especially confessionaries and catechisms that both are universal and particular. So Sandoval mm. is one of those meta-texts that <coughs> is both couched in the Council of Trent, but is also couched in his own experiences at the beginning of the 17th century. Uh, and my question in regard to this and the idea of a pan-Atlantic uh, uh, culture is that there are these mechanisms that are deployed through the Catholic Church in relationship also to the evangelization of America in which you have both particular questions regarding, especially the confessionaries, about practices that are local to renounce the devil. So that you have to, uh, the, these texts, and I assume that Sandoval's catechism has some of that in it. And what happens to that then is over time, and this is where Ginsburg is really important, is that you begin to have, at least in the Andes, a set of responses and uh, denials based upon the confessionaries that you have. So in other words, you have indigenous practices that are being subject, not to the Inquisition, because the Indians aren't subject to the Inquisition, but trials, but their responses no longer are the responses of what you would have gotten in the 16th century by unmediated practices, but these practices are now mediated by the questions that they are forced to answer. And that's what happens in, uh, in uh, Ginsburg when he mm. talks about that. Is that happening? I mean, can you sort of, tra I mean, there's a long tracing, but you, yeah. you can do this textually because you can see the information actually changing. And I think that that's what you were uh, uh, alluding to as well. Mm -hmm. Yes, no, the Does part that Sorry? Does that make any sense? Yeah, yeah, it did, it did, it did, it did. <laughs> <laughs> it did yeah. And by the way, for the students, you know those dreams when you're taking your exams and then everybody shows up and it's live streamed? <laughs> um, the difficulty, I think, for, for that question is that the moment within which the, um, this particular practice is recorded by the Inquisition is relatively short. It is within 50 years and then they, you know, they kind of lose interest, I, I imagine, around that. So for that particular practice, I don't think you could do it for the bosses. You could open it up uh, and look at um, the uh, testimonies for um, uh, in Cartagena, for example, for the beatifications. And, yeah. and, but how would you do that with different types of documents, right? But it's not, would, it wouldn't be answering the same questions. It would be answering different types of questions. I think it's doable, but it's, it's tricky. Yeah. 
And it's also involving so many different cultural perspectives together. Um, and in a way, it could be a goal uh, of doing all the work that we need to do to be able to answer that question. That would be a, a really large project that would be very interesting. But I don't think we can quite do it right now. Yeah. Thank you so much. I uh, really learned a lot and, and fascinating material. And I, I, my question just comes from quite, I guess, a perspective of uh, quite an ignorance. I just don't know the material at all. But I kept thinking about, I guess I was just reminded of uh, Homi Baba's science take, taken for wonder and thinking about what, um, how, I mean, maybe it's very uh, simplistic to think there is any element of uh, resistance or subversion. Uh, I don't know how these were actually, actually what what the clientele was, why mm -hmm. they were actually sought after. So I wonder if you can actually explain more before the Inquisition come in, like what was the actually situation that uh, made them so powerful and popular that became the target of the Inquisition itself, and if they were actually for the the slaves themselves or actually for people who are actually in. Portugal or Brazil that yeah, are not mm -hmm. slaves. And so it's maybe I'm just uh, kind of working on South Asia. I was just, I'm thinking like, oh, maybe there is sort of that unintended hybridity that makes sort mm -hmm. of that subversion that is more powerful and making a kind of resistance statement and uh, or not. I don't know. So I wonder if you can actually explain where they are coming in. Yes, thank you very much. The, uh, so the, a short answer um, about uh, these objects, that they were used by uh, everybody in the Portuguese, uh, in the Portuguese realm. Um, and that's what's part of their, um, uh, their power, I suppose, um, is that both Africans and Europeans were relying on their particular efficacy to achieve a certain uh, type of results. That is important because, because of that, they um, become the target of the Inquisition and of the Portuguese uh, state because the um, amulet makers basically are taking power into their own hands, right? And so that monopoly of power that the church and the state should have is being threatened. And that's when it becomes uh, a problem that is being addressed. Um, and. Um, so that's what we are seeing. Now, I don't see them. Uh, I don't um, uh, look at them through the lens of resistance. I think um, the point that I'm trying to make has more to do with the shape, the nature of power, and how uh, it functions in relationship to other attempts to give shape and control and harness um, the ability of invisible forces to have visible results and to take it at this level and that, because I think it's much more malleable than um, um, a, 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 um, a situation of uh, resistance and, um, and imposition, which obviously it is, right? Uh, but it is more amorphous within the social uh, interactions there. Thank you. Before you, yeah. I want, just want to interject one thing. Uh, in relationship to this, is that uh, in the Cartagena uh, inquisitional trials, it's also, uh, this is for Gina, it, that it's very often uh, a slave within the household who is then called upon by someone who is Spanish in the household to activate the, the so it's, it's not just within the slave community, and it really is actually, the cases often are about uh, Hispanic women, usually women who love potions, et cetera, mm -hmm. who are calling upon that power, not the church, to, to activate a love. So it, it really is one of, at least the Cartagena, that's often uh, one of the intersections between the white Hispanic population and uh, the Afro-descendant population over this. And that's when they get caught up in there. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. I would simply add to that that that's what's happening or happened in Salem as well, where they, um, it, it's part of the process of sort of discerning what the problem was, the issue of reading the bottom of tea, and then um, using that to counsel um, no. people.
people who are not part of the Barbados community. Um, but I have two, it, this is really wonderful, and actually three um, not necessarily linked sort of comments, questions. Uh, first is visual, the second is um, theoretical, and the third is historical. But if you could put up the four uh, images and let's see, the one with the kind of heart shapes at the top. Um, yeah, I'll get there. And uh, as you're as you're getting there, the um, what was interesting to me in your putting up the divination board and the other figure mm -hmm. is that that other figures identify the 18th century uh, image of the fi of that Vodou figure is identified as the god of counsel. So mm. that kind of link between I, I think it's important the question of the ability of this person to discern the roots of the problem and then to convey a solution. It kind of adds a, another layer. If I were going to read this from the mm -hmm. African or Dahomey side. Um, but I have a question about reading here specifically um, the language within, and I'm not asking you to do it here, but <laughs> the language within these kind of three heart-shaped elements in part because if I were to read those from the Dahomey context, they reference kidneys hmm. and ayi, which is a source of one's feelings and ideas. And there might be ways in which the actual shape uh, is helping to define, in a way, what kind of language is um, within it. So I just sort of just thinking about that, the relationship between text and form at some point might be interesting. Yeah. Um, so well, let me go to the historical question, uh, 1727 is when Agaja goes, uh, the Dahomey king goes to the coast and basically overthrows the Wida or the Savi court. Uh, and so this is presumably happening before then when he's enslaved or s slightly afterwards, which might be interesting to consider because he's also um, <coughs> taking up a lot of people from Alada and also from the area around Dahomey specifically, so Abome, and so that might offer some insight, but the leopard to me was a really important clue uh, insofar as that is associated with the god Po, which is the royal deity, and makes one wonder whether <coughs> that is a means of his claiming royalty within this as one does, I would imagine that one is not necessarily identifying a true history, but a history that one would hope in the context of an inquisition would give one greater authority. Mm. But that's a kind of interesting detail to think about, specifically what is happening at this time uh, in Dahomey, that he is uh, sort of seeing this whole transformation of the, of the area more generally to bring uh, into account in it. Um, as both yesterday's lecture and today's made me think and Skip is not here today, but I kept thinking through the idea of signifying. What, what you are arguing, in, in essence, is a kind of fluidity, and the ways in which these, and as in fluid, as in water and ink and blood, the way these forms co-join, in essence. And what he is arguing is a speaking of the same form to different audiences simultaneously. And I'm, I'm just curious about whether that there's a way that one might be able to think of these together um, in a way and wondering how you might do that. But also thinking specifically about your point of alchemy, which I think is really um, very interesting in this light, not only because I would argue alchemy has its roots in Egypt and so it's a, in a way an African phenomenon, uh, but also in Vodou and in this particular kind of bowl practice, it's not the individual ingredients so much, as critical as that is, but the combination of them. Uh, and so you can have however many bits of this, this, and this separately, but the power, the force, you know, the breakthrough is when they're all combined together, which is in essence what is also happening with alchemy. And that's also what's happening within these um, transatlantic worlds with a combination of peoples and ideas and uh, classes and functions and everything else. Thank you. Um, so uh, first about the the form <laughs> and the writing in inside those um, yeah. little capsules. Um, they don't make much sense. Um, they are um, 
kind of a mix of uh, Latin and Portuguese that sound vaguely prayer-like, um, but they don't. Uh, I, I I had begun to you know transliterate and and translate all of them, and I stopped at some point because I was convinced that it actually probably didn't matter so much that it was more performative and it had to look the part more than uh, meaning anything but it's worth going back and uh, trying again um, what is what I can say is that um, obviously is selling those things so he has a formula that is marketing um, and the dark shows the, what's in ink, and the blood is the lighter thing. So it's the way in which they are personalized, right? So you have the templates, and then according to your particular problem, you would have, you know, formula added. Um, and what's around the main designs would differ. So there is that dimension um, there. For the second question about um, uh, the double-sided meaning of it. I don't think that's the case because I think everybody knew exactly what they were doing, Europeans and Africans. And that's part of what is maybe baffling about them at the beginning, but actually makes a lot of sense that it is uh, an alternative realm of uh, uh, harnessing powers that is at play there. And I don't think they were hiding particularly. Um, I think it was uh, uh, what it was. So the, um, the fluidity that exists is um, uh, absolutely there in that it's merging together streams into a common beaker. Um, but I don't think it is a double face or it is an ambivalence. Um, it is uh, uh, actually quite self-consciously bringing uh, possibilities together um, in one form. And the third question about... You hit it on, I was just talking about the, the alchemy aspect of oh, yeah. the individual parts mattering less than the moment in which they're... Join. Yeah, no, there is two elements that it, that remains true in all of the descriptions and the examples that we have is that it is always three-dimensional, even if it's only a paper, um, and it's always made of several things. Uh, even if it's only a paper, it's a paper with a lot of different things on it and a lot of designs. So that composition is very important, and I think it's absolutely key. Um, and it makes it even easier for us to read it through the lens of alchemy as um, a matter that change in nature, right? There is a, a change in the nature of the ingredients that are brought together. And that is what is really powerful and what uh, was really perceived, I think, by the users and makers. Yeah, thank yeah, you. One, one last question. Cecile, using your words, um, looking the part, I should like to ask a question about representation in the academy. Mm -hmm. How has the work that you do gained greater intellectual gravitas or legitimacy because of the non-Africanness or African looking of that research? Can you say that again? How has the work that you've done mm -hmm. gained greater gravitas or legitimacy in the academy because of the non-Africanness or African looking mm. of the researcher? Thank you for your question. I, I, I don't know. I don't know. I think it is challenging preconceptions, perhaps, um, that it is not looking the part. Now, is it helpful to it? I'm not sure. I think on the contrary, um, it might be more difficult to bring into play something that challenges preconception rather than um, bringing to an audience what they're expecting to see and you know, going into that direction, right? So I would say probably not. Thank you. I just want to say, Skip congratulates you on a great talk. He's watching the live stream. So. <laughs> Thank you. Well. Are there any more questions, I think? Yes, one last question. I just have a quick question. I think you can probably hear me. Just a quick question. Were any of the users ever prosecuted, or were they just the makers who were persecuted? Uh, both, yeah, oh. both. So yesterday we looked at one, um, one example who belonged to a widow uh, in Madeira, and the uh, trial, it didn't go to trial, but the inquest was about her using this, yeah. <laughs> Thank you.
Well, thank you. Thank that you. was wonderful. <laughs>